All right, we are live. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another uh, Game Dev Hangout session. My name is Charles. This is uh, Infallible Code. And today I'm hanging out with Andrew Connell. You may know him as uh, Andrew. What, what is your Andrew with VR? There's something in the middle. VR with Andrew. V oh, VR with Andrew. I flipped it. I think I actually put it in the description wrong, too. So I'm going to have to fix that. Oh, it's fine. Don't they know who I am? VR with Andrew. Definitely check out his channel. Uh, we're going to have a conversation about all things game development, Unity, and especially VR. I have uh, definitely a bunch of questions because a couple months ago, I got my VR headset and I was like, I'm going to develop on this thing. And I really haven't done anything. So we'll have some conversations about that. Before we get into that, just a little bit of a um, uh, what do you call it? Housekeeping. Be sure to smash that like button if you're enjoying this. Uh, let's the algorithm know that you're enjoying this content. If you're new to the channel, please hit that subscribe button. Uh, we, I do weekly videos, uh, tutorials and uh, live streams, uh, time permitting, of course. Um, and without further ado, we'll get right into it. So, Andrew, why don't you tell everyone a little bit about yourself and, and your channel? Yeah, sure. So my name is Andrew. I'm a VR developer. I make weekly tutorials on YouTube about VR development. I also work as a contract simulation engineer, and I also am working on a few secret projects with some companies that you'll see in the near future. Very I cool. Can't talk, I can't talk about it just yet, but very cool. I got I to gotta seem very busy, so. <laughs> yeah, right. That's the game. You just gotta, yeah. Have you seen that Seinfeld episode where uh, George is like, he, he just looks angry in his office and everyone thinks he's busy, but he's just angry. Like he was like, he was trying to swat a fly and they're like, wow, and George, he's so busy. He's just, he's very, uh, he's very in tune with his work. He's very passionate about it. Exactly. Right. That's the key. You just got to look yeah. busy. <laughs> he just needs to smack it with a clipboard. So then he looks very busy. <laughs> Speaking of busy, you actually just released a video. Was that today or yesterday? It was yesterday. Yesterday. And it was uh, part zero of a new series you're doing. Um, I watched that. And so I definitely have questions there for you. Easy ones, I'm sure, for you. Yeah, hopefully. <laughs> yeah, right. So as you were going through it, so the, basically the series, um, well, tell everyone what the series is about, if you don't mind. So the series in of itself is VR for beginners. Obviously, we have a lot of series already out there that go over like toolkits and all mm -hmm. that good stuff. But... For this, I want to take a more exhaustive look, a slower look, and say the this starting from like a base project, trying to describe what the ecosystem is, what people are using, what they're not using, and trying to give you an idea of how I see things instead of just pulling up a project saying, "Oh, install this plugin, install that plugin, do this." But then you say, "Well, this doesn't work for me. I actually want to use this. Why can't I use this?" So I'm trying to answer a lot of those questions to prevent that feeling of being overwhelmed and not having an idea of where where you want to end up and maybe get people thinking about, well, I have a quest or I have this headset, I want to target desktop or I want to build an APK for side quests. Hopefully this is going to answer a lot of those just sort of questions of where do I want to end up. And the hope is that as the series sort of goes on, that we finish the sort of base project, but I think the hope is that there are people who are still following along go, hey, like, can we add this? Can we add that? And hopefully it becomes, again, more about that process of building rather than focusing on that sort of ultimate, like, this is the project we're making, making it more about the process and the problems that come along with it. Because with VR development, there are a lot of problems. Oh, yeah. I mean, so y you touched on... And I, I really appreciate this series because honestly, when I first got, I have the um, the quest. When I first mm -hmm. got it, I was super hyped to get in and just start messing around. And so the, my first question was like, all right, well, I guess how do I get the the Oculus dev kit? So I started doing some research. Come to find out that there's the Steam dev kit, and I'm probably saying that all wrong, but mm -hmm. you can you can use that too. And then there's another one that Unity's working on. So mm -hmm. I, I was like immediately overwhelmed. And I was like, okay, fine. I'm going to deep dive into each one of these things. These these three, I guess, SDKs or dev kits yeah, or whatever yeah. you call it. And they're each unique in their own way that it was just like, wow, there is so much to learn with this. Yeah. And I think that's the big thing, even for me or like us, like we've been working in industry or developers or what have you for like four or five years at least. So if it's, if I even find it somewhat overwhelming, I see it as being borderline impossible mm. when I look at myself four years ago or wherever I was at that point in my like career or skill level or whatever you want to call it. So, you know, taking a lot of that or just simply acknowledging 
hey, this is difficult. This isn't meant to be like, this is, this is, this is actually very overwhelming and it's okay to feel that way, but let's try <laughs> and like, you know, let's try and approach it in a way that we're, we know what we're getting ourselves into, but all of, hopefully also like just simplifying the process too. Yeah. Yeah. And, and the description of each one of those uh, dev kits that you gave in that first video was really helpful. Um, speaking well, speaking of your channel, it's funny. I see. I want to acknowledge the chat real quick. Just want to say hi to the, some folks that I recognize: Sparrowhawk, uh, Jason, um, uh, anyone that I Tavik, anyone uh, that I don't call out. I'm sorry, but thank you all for being here. Jason mentioned that it's true. When I first got my VR headset, he told me to go to your channel, and I did. And I was like, "Oh, this is great!" And I started. So you have a series on. If, uh, you have a series on each one of these dev kits, right? Like you have one on Oculus, or you well, have a couple of not, series, a couple of videos. Yeah, yeah. I have a couple of videos primarily, or I started off on Steam VR, mm. and then I have a few on Oculus for hand tracking. I think I was actually thinking earlier today that like hopefully, maybe once this series sort of pans out, I can go back and maybe do like a very specific like Oculus Quest and just be like, hey, we are started from square one, mm. and we're going to go all the way to building out an APK and like talking about that whole process because that's obviously a little bit more involved with getting things set up. And it's, yeah. again, another one of those things that it's like, well, I want to use this gigantic like setup of all this functionality. How exactly, what should I use? What shouldn't I use? If I want to create this kind of game or that kind of game, how can I leverage what's already existing? Because yeah. we, you know, I think it's a little, I don't know, sometimes it can be unreasonable for us to be like, oh, you can just make everything yourself. I, I do want to <laughs> try and leverage what's there because- yeah. That's a this, smart thing to do. That's a pragmatic thing to do. Yeah. And I think when I first started, especially with Steam VR, I did sort of approach it the opposite way, where I was just like, mm -hmm. we'll just build very simple versions of this. But the idea was like, okay, well, at least you'll understand it and you can add on yeah. to it. But with Unity's thing, which you did mention, is their whole interaction system that's coming out. That's one of the few ones that I've been like, this is actually worth like using, or it's it's simple mm. enough that most people can just throw it in their project and it works. Yeah, for mo most of the time. <laughs> Yeah, well, that's uh, any anything is gonna have its fair share of. It doesn't work for this case or that case. Yeah, yeah, for sure. <laughs> God, yeah, just all the edge cases and like, well, if I do this with this version, I'm like it's probably not gonna work. <laughs> yeah, I mean, when I first pulled um, Steam VR and started playing with that, I I kept trying to build everything myself. So like, I would mm -hmm. look at the prefabs that they had, and I didn't realize that you're just supposed to drag the prefabs into your scene and just use them. So yeah. like, I would be like, okay, well, I'm gonna create my own version of the prefabs, and I'm gonna, they have all these scripts. I just assumed that those scripts were whatever that they had written and, and provided as samples. So I was like, okay, cool. Well, I'm just gonna open up those scripts and reference the documentation and rewrite them. Well, you know, way too late in the process, I was like, oh, I'm just supposed to use the prefabs and not ask questions about how it works <laughs> exactly and that's part of the problem because i you know i don't know the entire it's a it's a big plugin i don't know everything about it but yeah. it's hard to have that expectation for one to know everything but like trying to dive into it and dissect it and figure things out about it it's probably going to continue to create more questions than answers yeah yeah and you know i think you touched on it in your video too um with the Oculus one where the folder structure is just very difficult to navigate. Mm -hmm. Right. And so I, I, I think the problem with these two, because they're both very great SDKs and they're very functional and they work. Um, but I think the problem is that they're in the middle, right? So when we entered this, we entered as programmers and technical people and we were like, okay, so I want to rip apart the code and write, you know, write to the APIs that they provide, right. but that's not what you're supposed to do. So someone, mm -hmm. so then, you know, you're like, oh, I realize now that I have to look in the folders, right? So then you have yeah. someone on the other end of the spectrum who's like, hey, I'm not technical. I'm just an artist type person. I can make really great 3D models. Now I want to use Steam VR and just start dragging and dropping the assets. But for that person, it's hard too because it's not clear you know it's not clear that that's what you're supposed to do at least yeah. in, from what i could tell yeah and 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 i do touch on just the sheer amount of things mm -hmm. on each little thing um because i got <laughs> starting out i got a lot of people which like why do you use this pre prefab over this prefab and i'm like well because this prefab mm. it's clean there's not a whole lot there which you know if you look at unity's new toolkit you look at the camera rig there, very simple, very mm. easy, not a whole lot going on. And 
another thing that I sort of touch on is that's a good thing, but it's also a bad thing because maybe that artist, maybe there are some artists out there who do figure out how to use it and like, oh, I can mock stuff up super quick. That's great for them. Yeah. But one, but one thing is if you're trying to learn how to program, a lot of the code there is very dense. It's mm -hmm. hard to sort of understand. So unless you have some sort of background, it's going to be very hard to sort of figure out how can you take these bits and chunks of code and be able to reuse them in your own project. Yeah, for sure. And I think that's always been an issue. Well, I, I don't want to sm talk smack about Unity, but it's always been an issue where you look at some example projects that are provided and you look at the code and it's like, what is this? You know, like, <laughs> I don't know. And, and what's funny is uh, Jason turned me on to a plugin called Cognitive Complexity. And there's this whole white paper on it that I could, I'll send you later. But basically, um, it, it, it can determine a method in a class's cognitive complexity based on a number of factors. And so this plugin will look and analyze your code. And as you write, you'll, there'll be a little score and a little green or red icon over your top of your method to let you know if this is an easy to read and easy to, for a human to understand method. And oh man, a lot of these classes, it's like it rates at like zero and it's red. And it's like, dude, I can't now I have validation that I that it's not just me. You know, this that's, code is hard to read. That's fantastic. No, you yeah. should send that to me because I would totally use that on my own stuff. Oh, I'll, I'll send it to you. Let's yeah, see. I'll, this is where I then make an entire video tearing myself apart. Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna drop into the oh, chat. I love this amazing. this plugin too because it just I don't know. Yeah. I, I take it at face value that it's it's I trust it you know wholeheartedly, yeah. which probably isn't a good thing. But as I'm writing, I'm like I want to get that score. As yeah. I don't even I think it's a higher. I'm not sure. I think lower score is better. It's like a little percentage, and I'm mm -hmm. like I'm trying to get that score down as I'm writing my my uh you know my code. I just yeah. dropped it in the chat. It's probably just like your cognitive load on, you know, obviously if it's lower, it's, you know, probably taking less to sort of process what's happening yes, or, yeah. or all it does is it just reads how many arguments you're putting into the function and it's just like zero. This is a good function. <laughs> <laughs> well, it actually like it does some interesting things like uh, I was writing, I was running, this is not game dev related, but a WinForms app. And um, one of the things I was doing was I was just trying to pull a string out of the app configuration so there's like this app there's like this static app management class that you call dot config and then you can pass in a string and get something right so mm -hmm. Very, not complicated at all. I was trying to get something out of config. And if it wasn't there, I was defaulting to some static property in the class. And I was doing all that in the function. So the moment that I pulled that little bit of logic into a getter, uh, it, the complexity went down by like 5%. So I was like, oh, wow, that's crazy. Like it realized that I simplified how to read that method by just mm -hmm. putting it into a, a, a getter property that does yeah. all that null checking for me and just returns a, a reasonable value. So yeah, yeah it's uh, pretty cool. I, I like that plug. Yeah. I, I, highly I recommend think it, it may even just automatically be like, this is something that could, you may accidentally write somewhere else. Mm -hmm. So it's just saying, oh yeah, if you just put it there and if you need to use it somewhere else, you don't have to have all this redundant stuff everywhere. Yeah, yeah. So back back to the point, or you can just see the how technical we are. When I first <laughs> when I first got into like Steam Steam VR, I was like, I want to do all that. I want to write the code. And yeah, so you don't. That's not how you do it. So I think like I I feel like the middle ground would be obviously better documentation on both companies oh, parts. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, you know, there should be some sort of landing page that says, hey. This is how the product is meant to be used. Here's the prefabs folder. And here are the separate like categories of prefabs. Like here are the types of cameras and maybe the scenarios you would use these cameras each, you know, here are the types of hands, you know, are you doing hand tracking? Grab this prefab. If you're just doing like, you know, controller, grab this prefab and mm -hmm. things like that. But, um, but so I'm curious, tell me how Unity's implementation, what is it called? Uh, XR toolkit. So what is that all about? Because I, I, I didn't, I purposely didn't dive into it back when I got my headset because I realized that it was still like kind of an alpha or beta. Yeah, it's still in preview. I actually don't know mm. when it's coming out of preview, um, but it's very much sort of the what a lot of people use Steam VR or Oculus VR for, which is not only some of that extra functionality that's specific to whatever library that is, but the interaction system that comes with it. So it's like, I don't want to write this stuff where I need to pick up and drop objects or have velocity on things. I don't, you know, I just want to make 
I just want to make a shooter. I want to have gun physics. I want to have a fully IK character. I want to have all this cool stuff. I can't waste my time <laughs> building an interaction system. Right. So those that's what a lot of that serves for most people. Mm-hmm. But XR Toolkit offers a lot of that stuff, but we're just out the fluff. It's just, here's your rig. If you want a room space one or a stationary one, here are your type of interactors. If you want canvas inter- interaction, here you go. It really cuts out a lot of those extra steps where before it's like, oh, can I get a pointer for canvas? Well, it doesn't work like that. Most mm. people would use this other plugin and people are like, I don't want to buy this plugin. And <laughs> so a lot of the time it's just cutting back on a lot of those barriers for people just to be like, I just want to have something super simple that I just want to try out and just see how it goes. It, it really eliminates a lot of those extra steps for just for that base functionality for picking up objects, dropping them, uh, canvas interaction, all that stuff. Yeah. Yeah. And I, and I think that's totally fine. Like, you know, if there's, it, it's almost like, uh, you've got keyboard input. And so, you know, unity's original implementation was, Hey, you just call input dot get key and that's it. You're mm-hmm. encapsulating out what is input. And in the same way, it's the same for your VR headset. You know, you're just encapsulating that out. You shouldn't really be concerned too much about, you know, how it works. It's just, Hey, all you know is that your user is doing this thing and this is how you want your game to respond to that. So yeah, mm-hmm. that, that sounds really promising. I'm, I'm very interested yeah. to, to poke around that. Yeah. And I think the hope also is that you can get some good integration with the Unity's newer input system. Mm-hmm. Since SteamVR does sort of, they sort of do the same thing where Oof, have that UI. Action, yeah, we have the actions <laughs> and then you can bind input to it. But Unity more or less does the same thing, but it's a little bit, um, it doesn't have all the visual components, but it's kind of doing the same thing. Yeah. Um, and I think that could be super useful too, but that is like a whole nother discussion of getting that sort <laughs> of getting that sort of implemented and everything. Cause what I've ultimately done for my own project is sort of written my own little controller and everything to use the <laughs> new input system, because just to make using different controllers easier, or yeah. when I want to teleport, I want to press down on this controller, but for this other one, I want it to be at the joystick forward, you know, consolidating all that. So I don't have to, yeah, I don't have to manually ask, Oh, what controller are they using? Are they using this one or that one that can obviously get very messy very quickly. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I for one, you know, I know a lot of folks don't really like the new input system and and I, yeah. I yeah I get that it's complicated but you know I come from the enterprise business world so I understand I understand configuring comp- complicated applications. Mm-hmm. And so what you're doing is you're doing a lot of work up front in the UI but it makes sense because when you get down to your game logic, you you don't really want your logic doesn't need to be wrapped up in. Did this come mm-hmm. from a keyboard or a mouse or was it a mm-hmm. joystick? Was it a VR joystick? Your coach just be like, hey, I got this input and I know that when this input comes in, I throw a grenade. You know, yeah. that's all that should really matter. That And I really appreciate that encapsulation. So I've been trying to figure out a way to just like. Not that I need to sell that concept to others, but just just to be like, you know, there's a lot of power in this new input system. Oh, for sure. And I I would I would agree with that, too. But even like the thing is, I haven't looked it into it until recently mm. uh, up until this point, because I looked at it the first time and I was just I was like, no, I'm not I'm not touching this right now. I'll come back <laughs> to it later because I was just it, it looked very complex to me. And you look at the documentation and there's so many different ways of handling it. But it may sort of lack that context of in this situation, maybe you want to use this kind of like handling it this way, or if you're doing it this way, maybe handling it this way. It's very, it's, but it's more just sort of, here's a quick start guide. If you're crazy, here's, here's a bunch of pages. If you want to dive a little bit deeper. Yeah. Yeah. I, I made the mistake of making a couple of videos on it. And uh, I, oh. say mistake, I say a mistake because I constantly get comments on those videos saying, but it doesn't work like this. And it's like, <laughs> I know, look at the date of the video. It's, it was an yeah. old one. <laughs> yeah, I get, yeah, I get that too. Yeah. But uh, I'm interested to see how it, how it pans out. Um, yeah. A, a lot of features really, because, you know, I think a big complaint, a couple, you know, even as early as beginning of this year is that you know unity is rolling out a bunch of alpha features and not you know not baking them out and not finishing them but we're starting to see that they really are coming to fruition you know dots is an example um, of where they're finally starting to expose a lot of that in the ui and it seems like they're making a lot of progress on this um the x xvr 
toolkit. Say that right? Was it XVR toolkit? Uh, XR toolkit. XR toolkit. Or you say XRTK. I think that's what the, the young kids are saying these days. XRTK. Wow, so hip. <laughs> but yeah, no, it's cool to see that a lot of these things are finally getting fleshed out. And I think the input system, that's that's such a critical part, you know, of, of the, the whole pipeline of creating uh, creating games. Yeah, yeah it's, certainly, the engine. it's certainly a lot better than the original uh sort of graphical input thing it had with those weird drop downs and uh-huh. with the joysticks. Like I never used controllers or tried to do multiplayer because that just looked impossible. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, but totally. I think it's an improvement over that, but it's just so easy to just type in an update, you know, get get space bar, do a thing. It's just yeah. that that level of like simplicity for a lot of people. It's very hard to some people just want to see it. They're just like, I just want to know. Yeah. where it is in code and I, it's super simple i don't need to mess with anything else so i think there's you know it i don't know there's this two different kinds of people i think that they may not yeah. ever be happy with having this entire other yeah. interface to deal with well it's like uh it's like dependency injection uh i way back when i covered this framework called zenject now called mm-hmm. extendject it's like a dependency injection framework it's um it's relatively high like lightweight but at the end of the day, it's an entire framework that you're like pumping into your your application code. And uh, it's great, but you realistically, you know, injection, you could just do it yourself. All injection is, is you have a class that has a constructor or has some sort of dependency on something and someone else is responsible for populating it, right? So mm-hmm. the, the framework just does all that work for you. And so it's just a matter of like, what are the needs of the project? If you're going to if you're going to create a game and you're saying you're limiting yourself to, hey, this is going to be a, on PC, it's going to be a top down movement. And that's all I really care about. Then you can hard code WASD, you know, input into your code and you're, you'll be set for life because you're not going to be exactly. porting it to Xbox and you're not going to be, you know, trying to handle. Oh, I want to handle controllers and game pads. Um, so, yeah, it just really just depends on the project. Yeah, that's like the answer that people hate to hear. It depends. Oh, yeah. No, I <laughs> <laughs> that happens a lot. It's just so where where do you want this to end up? And it's just kind of well, I'm trying to do this. Well, you could use this or this. It's up to you. Because that especially happened after I released that video. Because obviously, if someone's already invested in what they're using, it's going to take a lot for them to try and port it to something else. So a lot of people are trying. They're looking for some level of encouragement into what they're doing is not wrong. And mm. it does sort of come down to what are the needs of your project. What headset do you have? What you know? What kind of you know art style do you have? And where is it ultimately going to end up? Because if you have an index and you have high level graphics and you're going to be you're going to be on desktop, you're going to want to probably use Steam VR. So that's you know it's again it's a perfectly valid option, but it not be not may not be the option for everybody. You know. Yeah, and that's why I like in that video um, that you put out yesterday that you actually mentioned like, hey, these this is the use case like Steam VR. If you're doing prototypes or you need something quick, that's a great option there. And then, so yeah, I think that that's real. That's a really valuable thing to impart, you know, on on people like me who don't really know where to begin and are completely overwhelmed by it. <laughs> uh, got a question in the chat there. Uh, have you ever have you, you or Andrew ever used the editor XR? I have not. Have you heard of that? I actually just Googled it. It seems like a Unity thing. I may need to look at that. Uh, Unit, well, Editor XR. I Googled Editor. it and I found Editor VR, Experimental Build Today. I was in 2016, so this is probably not what he's talking about. Mm. But, uh, oh, well, I guess the, the quick and dirty answer is sorry. I've, I've never actually heard of it. Um, but, hey, drop it in the chat. I'm interested to know what that is. Yeah, uh, no, I've never, never used that. <laughs> this may have been a little bit before my time, actually. Yeah, I mean, I'm looking at some pretty old videos in here, 2016, 2017, uh, but maybe, maybe I got it wrong. Is it, a, is it a Unity specific? Oh, it's like a workflow. Okay, no, I've seen this. Oh yeah, I've never used it before though. Huh. Interesting. Yeah. Cool. Well, are you? Um, so you're 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 VR with Andrew. Do you got any? Got any VR projects in the works? Or what what, is it, what are some yeah. cool things you've worked on? Cool things I've worked love on. Love that question. I love getting that what question. The things I've been working on recently. Been working on recently. Um, so outside of just videos, obviously we're going to be continuing the sort of beginner series. I've been sort of teasing a little bit on my Patreon about that I'm I've been replaying Half Life Alex again. 
Oh, and so I've been great game. wanting to delve and just like start take start building little projects about things that I like in there. Mm. And they may be like gigantic, like full blown mechanic type stuff, or mm. they may just be like little tiny little details that I really like um, that people may find useful. Where it's just um, one thing that uh, I really like or I think is kind of cool is like some not all the interactions are sort of treated the same. And one of those things is for buttons where on your hand, obviously anytime you press a button, it's gonna be pressed. But <laughs> if you sort of throw an object at a button, it's not gonna react to it. But what you can do is if you're holding an object that sort of becomes an extension of your hand mm -hmm. and you can then press that button. So there's that sort of idea that whatever you're holding is just an extension of your hand and being able to uh, make that sort of interaction area of the object you're holding be sort of be considered a hand even though it is a weapon. So that's one thing it does when you like step into an elevator, you don't have to switch to your, you know, just to just your hand and not have a weapon to press the button. You can just take the weapon to press it. But yeah, there are those weird, those little things that make your game so much easier to play that yeah. we may sort of miss out on. Yeah, it's an interesting thing too. And it, and I, I know that, you know, usability is a is across the board something that everyone should focus on. But with VR especially, it, you know, you are you know, the big thing about VR is that it's uh, it's immersive, right? So there's like, I think, a higher expectation when someone puts on a headset and gets into your game that they are expecting uh, the the usability to be just so. There's certain, I feel like, unsaid expectations. And I think like you, you talked about Half-Life Alex is a great example. Like if I pick up a bottle and I throw it and it breaks, it's like, yes, that's how I expect, that's what I expected to happen. Certain other things too, like uh, I'm trying to think of some interesting interactions that, um, I guess like the shotgun, like I, I remember when I first got the shotgun, like it just was so intuitive that you pick it up and you when you load it, you can like snap your hand to close yeah. it. And like, I don't remember ever being told to do that. Yeah. Or, or, or yeah. It actually took me a while to be like, oh wait, can I just, and it worked. I was like, huh, you know? Yeah. You know, speaking about a lot of the weapons in that game, it's it's an interesting uh, experiment in terms of simplicity because mm. it doesn't have with a with one exception, all the interactions are one handed. There's no in, you know incredibly mm. complex like two handed weapons where you hold it with one and you aim it with the other. Yeah. Um, you know the pistol, the shotgun, some machine gun, all that stuff. It's one handed operation. So. A lot of so you could still get so much mileage out of just be, making things really simple, mm. including like there's the hand wheel in it that you know you just need one hand to operate. But you'll see in a lot of other VR games you need two handed interaction. Obviously, one handed interaction is going to be a lot simpler, but, but also maybe open it up for other gameplay moments where you can be like you can have a weapon in one hand but also spinning the hand wheel at the same time. So even though it's simpler, it may have a little bit more openness for different kinds of gameplay yeah no it, there's definitely a lot of synergy with other things you know like you have a grenade in one hand your shotgun in the other hand you're running through shooting things throwing grenades and then mm -hmm. on top of that you know it really will on that same note it opens up the possibility space of how you can uh you know how you can confront any interaction or problem in the game because now you're right and i hadn't thought about that because everything's one-handed and if can you you can you pretty much do everything with both hands? I'm trying to remember, with the, with the exception, your weapon's only going to be on your dominant hand. on your dominant hand. Okay, yeah, yeah. but yeah, no, uh, the grenade is a simple example of something that I can recall always having a grenade in one hand and my gun out, ready to walk into a room, and like you yeah. know that is just one thing yeah. that it, it's it's a simple rule like that, and it's interesting because it's something that I've been thinking about as I work through a game that I've been working on that my mind kind of goes to these places where like, oh, what if I could do that? What if I could do this? But I find that the simpler you keep things and, and if you make those hard rules, um, and that, that might be kind of vague, but if you if you really limit, you know, the complexity of things, but you make sure that they work, that they that everything can work together, it's insane how many interactions can just kind of happen naturally that you never would have expected. Yeah, exactly. And that kind of touched on like the sort of button thing but also a lot of the interactions in the game, how some of them, like the handles and things like that, they don't even have like collision in terms of being able to collide with other objects if you throw a can at it or something like that. So mm. the, there isn't this very 
there isn't a very specific line of this is how everything's going to behave in the game. It's very much this level of what is the line of believability and mm. what is the line of just making sure that, you know, we have players expectations, right? Right. Yeah. yeah. And but, what's interesting on that too is uh, the man, I, I'm, I'm really bad with like quotes and things, but I, I, there was someone who was, I'm trying to remember. It was like maybe a talk, maybe one of the many like DDC talks that I saw, I've seen, but uh, it, it was some developer talking about, you know, if I'm going to uh, program for my game a submarine, I'm not going to learn about the physics of how a submarine can submerge and and try to implement those exact deals. It's but you you want to get an approximation of that, you know, yeah. you want it to be as realistic as possible without literally programming the physics and of water and all that. Yeah. And, and that's and I think that's what you're you know, kind of what you're saying there. We're like you want to approximate real life, but there's going to be some you know concessions that you make for better usability, uh, better feedback for the player. Um, and I think those are important. Those concessions are important. Yeah. And I think with that some level of believability and being like realistic, you know, coming from a simulation background, that's a fight you're constantly battling, which mm. is what is the definition of realism? What is the definition of believability? You know, we may say like, oh, we should be able to grab things from a distance. It's like, well, that's not realistic, but it's a usability thing, you know, or yeah. it's, it's much easier for a player. We don't want them bending down to pick something up every 30 seconds. That's just, you know, what, if we're trying to teach them something, we need to make that as smooth as possible. So that's constantly a, a talk that's, you know, constantly happening depending upon what project it is. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. It's a, and it's a constant battle trying to figure out how to give that experience to the user. Yeah. Um, question for you in the chat. Um, yeah. Where did it go? Uh, Andrew, what are some things that excite you about the direction of VR? Start with that. Things that excite me. <laughs> that's a that's an interesting question, and I actually I don't know right now. Hmm. Actually, I I think more headsets becoming wireless is something is an idea mm. that, that does excite me because even though I love my Vive and I love my Index controllers, like not having a cable is like the best thing in the entire world. Like I'll <laughs> buy things on quest just because even if it doesn't look as good, just because I don't need to use just because I don't have a cable. And there's a lot of people who use virtual desktop to stream, you know, for all that kind of stuff. But having it wireless is certainly a big thing for me. Mm. Um, but other than that, I don't know if I know of any like things on the horizon in terms of games or projects. Have you ever used, um, just on the note of uh, wireless, the pulley systems? Uh, yes, I have. Yeah. Are, there any, are we, there any good? Because I'm thinking about getting it, getting set it, up here. I didn't use it that much. We had it at like my old job that I worked for a little bit, but mm. it seemed all right. Yeah, it was just, it was more of like a bungee cord of some sort that would okay. keep it like off the floor. And they... They seem to work. I've seen, I see them a lot at like conferences and things like that where they have these gigantic mapped areas and then they just have like these teams of people well they've kind of gone away from some of that but they have all-inclusive systems with like laptops and backpacks and things like that <laughs> but um but yeah a lot of them do sort of keep have like that sort of like tethering system to keep it from you not stepping on it <laughs> yeah yeah i've looked on amazon and they have like some pretty affordable like little pulleys that you just you know adhere to your ceiling and wall yeah, i don't know how I've, ugly I've, it looks you know what i I'll take, I'll try one and I'll let you know how it is. Cause like <laughs> I, I try to keep things nice, but sometimes like at the end of the day, my desk is covered in controllers, my headset, <laughs> every, there's just stuff everywhere. So I'm hoping to one day have a desk set up that is, that minimizes all of that mess and everything. <laughs> yeah. I'm kind of i I'm kind of an anal person, so I always keep things nice and tidy. So if you have yeah. any tips, let me oh, know. Yeah. I'm trying. <laughs> like I don't like having a lot of things, but I'm failing at keeping my <laughs> workspace at a minimalist level. <laughs> yeah. I'm actually, um, I'm about to start my wife and I just purchased a house. We're going to, we're going to move in later this month. And I'm like super excited to set up my office. And mm -hmm. one of the things I want to do is like do the whole pulley system, but yeah, man. Yeah. <laughs> no, you should just go for it. It's I'm a new go house, for it. new house, new beginnings. 
Heck yeah. Get that pulley system you always wanted. Oh, yeah. yeah. Get that pulley system all. Yeah, I've been dreaming about since I was a little kid. <laughs> uh, that's awesome. Oh, there was a follow up question to that first one. Let me see if I can find it here. Uh, where was it? What is a mechanic in VR that you've been particularly obsessed with recently? Gravity gloves. Hmm. Those are amazing. Just I the think the concept of being able to pull things. Yeah, that's yeah. just so much like that is so much fun and you feel so cool doing it. And it's not, you know, it isn't incredibly difficult to do. It's not the most, um, it's, it's something within reach for a lot of us. I'll put it that way. And it's so much more enjoyable than just a simple distance grab yeah. or um, the sort of progression of it was in job simulator, there was like a timer on things. And when they'd fall off the table or they hit, hit the ground, they'd reset their position. That's not fun. <laughs> well, let's be able to grab things from a distance. That's a little bit better. But then it's just like, well, you can select an object and it doesn't necessarily do anything until you pull actually, back. you know, pull it back or, you know, do some sort of extra motion. And that's just really fun. It's always cool to when you're playing and you finish a fight or something like that and you see like uh, like a health, I forget exactly, a health syringe and you could just sort of like not even be looking at it completely, select uh -huh. it, look away, pull it, grab it, inject yourself and drop it. And it's just like the coolest feeling in the entire world. Um, yeah. over something just like that, which started from just a simple distance grab. So that's something I really like, just the application of it. It makes it so much more enjoyable. Huh, yeah. Being too crazy. I think so too. I think the challenge there is how do you justify it in your game? Like Half-Life Alex, where he actually had the glove and she put yeah. it on. <laughs> you know, like how do you fit it into the story of your game? Or that's maybe you just don't. Just, yeah, and that's the thing. Some Some games don't need to explain it right and it comes yeah. back to that question of is that unrealistic is that believable is it you know yeah i think we'll all just all have telekinesis and we can all just grab and that's that's an accepted thing yeah until you run into a game that doesn't have that and you're like oh and then it shatters their entire totally understanding of your game so you just got to make it a constant across all vr games so yes. that you don't have to explain it <laughs> yeah exactly Imagine like a completely benign, you know, maybe like a 3D adventure puzzle game where you're like set in the 50s or something like like just completely like non fantasy game. You know what I mean? And, but all of a sudden you're like whipping things into your hand. Yeah. So, it's like there's no need to explain it. It's just a VR you have, game. Yeah, no, you just have like a yo-yo on your hand and you flick the yo-yo and it wraps around <laughs> it and you pull it back. See? There you it go. It writes itself, you know? There you go. Yeah, it just writes I like itself. The 1950s, my brain's like, yes, yo-yos. The peak <laughs> decade. Yeah, man. Yo-yos used to be cool, right? Yeah, were they? they were. They were <laughs> at one point. When you, two, 20 years ago, yeah. there was a time in my life where yo-yos were the coolest thing ever. Yeah, I remember being in like elementary school mm -hmm. and all of us getting called down to the, yeah, the gymnasium and there's like five like 20-year-olds with yo-yos just running around stage doing... <laughs> Wow, we didn't have that. No, I thought they were, oh. were going to call you all in the auditorium and be like, "No more yo-yos." <laughs> no, they had like a traveling uh, oh, band of yo-yoers that came and like performed for us. Was it like Duncan or there was another popular brand at the time? I don't know what the brand was, but they were doing they were doing flips, jumping around on like little trampolines. But then the yo-yos were the constant. They'd all like they'd be running up to each other and like yo-yoing. I'm sure there's a video of it somewhere that's <laughs> completely embarrassing to those in, in it. But <laughs> I wonder if anyone's ever implemented a yo-yo in VR. Someone did Challenge. it. With hand, someone did it with hand tracking. Oh, I nice. Was, yeah, he did like the whole. I forget where the move. I, I was thinking walk the dog, and I was like, that's not right. He does the the cradle where he does like the little triangle. Oh, that's like, awesome. I could never do it in real life, so maybe I can live out my yo-yo <laughs> dreams. Um, I don't know if it's an accessible thing, but again, talking about Twitter earlier, it's, he's one of those people that can make incredible yeah. gifts, you know, that you just see on Twitter. You're like, I can never do that. Yeah. Like it's just so amazing. Like you never have to yeah. create a game, just create a bunch of gifts and you're set. <laughs> yeah, you are You'd be like, if you want these high quality gifts, Patreon, you know, fun fact, I can, um, I can actually juggle in real life, but I could not juggle in, uh, in half-life Alex. And I saw a whole bunch of people doing it. I was like, Oh, really? I should be able to do that. And I couldn't do it. Couldn't how make many, it. How many objects can you juggle? I can juggle three. Let me see if I can do it on oh, camera. No, right no, no. Hold on, let me, I want, I want to be able to see if I'm in the frame here. All right. So I got three things, two Rubik's okay. cubes in my phone. Yeah. Cause, Oh, Oh, 
Oh I man. Mean, I don't know if that, that showed. That, <laughs> see, you can make, that's what you need to do for your, for your hand tracking project. You can make a juggling sim yes. and you can get all those likes on Twitter. You're right. You, that's going to be the next God. gift that goes up on my Twitter channel is yes. me juggling and my juggler sim. <laughs> There's actually some pretty, this is like way off topic, topic, but I follow a juggling subreddit and it's like, you think it's just, hey, I can juggle, right? But no, these these folks on the juggling subreddit can do the most bizarre things, like juggle five balls while like throwing them on the floor or like bouncing on like a little board doing it. Mm -hmm. There's this one yeah. guy who juggles four balls and he like taps his feet in a way that's like a certain rhythm. And it's just like, wow, I just thought that. So, uh, so, you're, so, you're, so you're telling me it's like, not only do you need to juggle, but you need to be able to perform other tasks at the same time. Oh, I yeah. They, they've taken it to the next level. <laughs> juggled Rubik's Cubes, I think. And he solved them as he juggled them. Oh, gosh. Get out yeah. of here. Yeah. I think he was. Yeah. It was like three or something. Or it was. Yeah. I'm pretty sure that's what it was. I don't know. Uh, I, Gumby in the chat asked if I can do outside in juggling. And I certainly can. Let me see. I'm, I'm, this is where I'm going to botch it. Ready? Let's see. I mean, you've already, you did it the first time. You've already. It's a oh, yeah. It's a different. It's different. Like you throw it on the outside as opposed to the inside. You get me? So inside is like this. I'm throwing in, but outside is like you're throwing it out. Yeah. Right? Yeah, he, you this, know, this went off on a tangent. <laughs> well, he actually already had his pulley system installed, and all those objects were just falling down. Well, little, 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 little do you know, we are actually in VR right now. Right, this yeah. is the most sophisticated VR uh, <laughs> simulation ever. <laughs> Speaking of simulation, simulation, that sounds like a great segue to talk about what it is you actually do in simulation, because I'm very curious about that. And like, what does that entail? And does it involve Unity? Yes, it does. OK, I'm just yeah, I've been just a Unity developer for like five or six years. Um, <laughs> That's a very simple question with a very diverse answer, <laughs> which I could kind of go back to where it sort of started, where I, when I first graduated college, I was working, I was interning at a research lab, started working at that research lab where we would do grant work, where people would come in and be like, I have this grant, I want to do research for this thing, I need an app or I need a game or something like that, can you guys make it for me? And mm. we were the people that would make it for them. So, some of the projects I worked on were, we had someone who was looking to do a study on people with cancer and was like, hey, we wanna tell this narrative story to hopefully enforce people to be taking care of themselves. So they're like taking their medicine, they're drinking water, they're doing all that kind of stuff. And what I would do is we would talk to the subject matter expert, know what they sort of, hear the things that they need to do. And we would eventually make this sort of narrative with all of this sort of tracking and surveys and all that kind of stuff that would then go into this sort of report or this paper or something like that. Gotcha. So that's one part of it. Another thing would be when I first started getting into VR, which is where we have more sort of traditional clients where we had a really big company that came to us in a particular industry uh, where we would need to train people for these high risk situations. And that could be a, an example of like a firefighter or something like that, but they they need to be in these sort of very hazardous or potentially dangerous situations that you can't replicate in real life. So they would come to us and they would say, hey, we want to be able to train people to recognize these sort of dangers in their workplace or something like that. And again, we would sort of be the person to build this thing in VR or what have you. So we would be building the environments, the mechanics, um, some of the data tracking that they would need, all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. So that's those are the those are two of them. Um, and but as of late at my current job, similar things where we're doing we're going to be doing some work with the CDC and the National oh, Institute wow. of Health and all that kind of stuff. So it's a lot more of that sort of. There's a lot of different ways that you can sort of articulate it, whether you want to call it serious games or mm -hmm. games with a purpose. You know, there's a lot of people who don't like a lot of the other labels, so I'm not exactly sure what we're calling it right now, but <laughs> it's kind of that, it's kind of that work. Yeah. And, I, and you know, I, I feel like, I don't know why people are afraid or if people are afraid to say that you can make things that are not games in Unity, 
but you know you can certainly the like the automotive industry makes uh sim simulations from what i understand um, which aren't games they actually use them for business purposes to to yeah. mo model you know realistic uh, environments or, or maybe situations that cars would get into and being able to to test that and yeah, think, yeah there's plenty of other this, industries yeah yeah no they the other industry game for like other industries for the application of unity is only it's only continuing to grow as well right. as with the introduction of like more like better vr headsets because years ago when i would go to these simulation conferences it would just be this really weird headset or something that you've never seen before that costs fifty thousand dollars a hundred thousand dollars <laughs> And it was just like, and you'd pay that money, and the thing you got, in contrast to what we're using now as consumers, night and day, yeah. it's so much better. But now you go and you see just like more use of off-the-shelf engines, like Unreal and Unity. You see vibes and indexes. So like, to get from like where you are as a developer, whether you want to be in games or you're just like, man, I just want to make stuff that I that people experience, whether it needs to be fun. Or yeah. needs to be informative or something like that. If you're just like me, I just like building things. I don't really particularly, it doesn't need to be something that's ultimately fun. I just kind of like, <laughs> I don't know. I just like building. Yeah. No, I feel you. I, you yeah. know, it's just like, it's if there's an itch that it scratches where it doesn't. Absolutely. You know, the goal isn't always to be fun, but it, that still process can still be enjoyable. You still get those silly bugs. You still get to hang out with a bunch of cool, creative people, but it's just another application of it. Yeah, as Zero One mentioned, um, another industry is architecture, and that's a good point. Mm -hmm. uh, one thing that I've recently done is with this new house that me and my wife are pur purchasing, um, I wanted to see it in 3D space. So I found a um, I found a program called Sweet Home 3D, and it allows you to put uh, put the dimensions. Like you can put down a blueprint, and you can lay down the dimensions of like the walls and where doors might be. Um, so we we set it up and it's really cool and but the but the application stinks. The rendering engine inside of Sweet Home 3D is garbage and they have a little like uh, you can walk you can do a tour a virtual tour but it's like you can't strafe you know like you you can only uh -huh. go forward and back and like rotate so yeah. and it's like so choppy so I was like screw this I took I exported the model I think it's like an .dot obj j dropped it in a Unity dropped a 3D person controller dropped in some nice lighting and put the HDR IP or whatever the HDR pipeline and um, and it looks great. And now it's like, yeah. heck yeah, dude, look, this is my house now. And I have it in 3D. Oh, and, <laughs> and that's like a whole, again, that's like a whole industry of people. Uh -huh. um, before, before I ever used a Vive at my first job, we had this, this mixed reality headset that used all of these, these, they used markers. If you've seen any of the early screenshots of Vive where you would go, they would have a room where all the walls just had these markers on them. And that's how it would do its positional tracking. Mm. Um, we would use that headset and it was very difficult to use. It was not fun, but the point is, it was meant for that sort of enterprise setting. It was meant for those really big companies that were doing uh, car design, architecture, all that kind of stuff. So it, again, to sort of like reiterate that, it's still a very like common and growing thing that people are using it for. And it's not something that's recent. It's something that spans back like, you know, decades. I don't know exactly how long, but it's not a recent thing. <laughs> right. <laughs> I'm looking at the chat here. Um, Jason had mentioned something called mentioned something called Materialize, which is another just an app that was created in Unity. Um, and Yar mentioned Twin Motion for CAD. What? I can see my house in VR. Twin Motion. Oh man. Okay. I'm I'm putting all these into my browser. I love these streams because uh, as we talk about things, I always like I fill my browser up with like tabs of things I want to research. Heck yeah, that's great. <laughs> Twin motion. Just, yeah, I've seen materialize more here and there. Yeah. So evidently, that's an app that was created in Unity. No, but it's it's cool. Um, I I think um, I think that that's what Unity wanted. I think that's why more recently they have been you know expanding on different you know avenues as far as trying to to again some of the prime examples are like dots, HGRP, uh, the new input system. There's just a lot of they're just doing a lot of things because the more they can add into the engine and make it less of a game engine and more of like a very powerful rendering engine, then the more industries are going to be able to use it. And that's really better for everyone because mm -hmm. that means there's going to be more unity assets, more plugins, more SDKs built for unity. It's only a good yeah. thing for game developers and everyone across the board. So I think that's really, really cool yeah. stuff. Yeah. Cause years ago, again, when everyone was making their own engines, 
<laughs> none of them were great. None of them looked good. And we all had to build everything, you know, yeah. from scratch. But yeah, it's that and it's just like the just the focus and the funding. And also, if you're looking to get in the job market, you know, there's yeah. more jobs, there's more opportunities. Yeah, that's actually a cool point. You know, uh, if you're if you're uh, someone who has poured a lot of time into learning Unity and maybe it's because you want to be an indie game dev, um, what you may have inadvertently done for yourself is m made yourself marketable on the job, you know, for jobs that require Unity experience and they may not be game studios. You know, they could be simulation companies or, you know, ArcViz companies or uh, something in the auto industry. And that, I think that's really cool. Because, uh, mm -hmm. you know, I, I do like Unity, working with Unity for the sake of working with Unity. I think it's a great tool, um, just like I really like working with Premiere Pro. Uh, people probably have like horror stories, but like I really do enjoy editing in Premiere Pro for whatever reason. Maybe I'm a masochist. I have not made the jump to Premiere Pro. Oh, what are you I've, using? I've, I've like skated around. I've, I'm too ashamed to admit. Oh. It's, it's actually like the the Rush Lite, essentially, or oh. like the Premiere Lite. It's called premiere rush i think and it's i didn't know this when i first started using it but it's meant to be used on mobile devices oh really and that's so, funny. yeah so i think the, the allure of it is that it's like you can edit anywhere but it's also <laughs> just thing is for tutorials for me it's just all i need to do i need to cut up footage i need to fade in between things i need to make sure it sounds okay like that's right. all i need to do and that's what it does but the minute i try and do anything extra it, it just doesn't do it. So I, I used to use Sony Vegas, but I've just been oh, wanting, yeah. I've just been trying to justify getting into Premiere, but I just haven't made the jump yet. Should I do it? Hey, if, if, if it works, don't, or if it ain't broke, don't I, fix it. It's you kind know? of, the thing is it's kind of working. Like there's a few <laughs> like pains here and there, but yeah, I've, I've been wanting to jump. I've been kind of wanting to jump ship. Here's what I'll say. Do you have any issues with like, like choppiness? Like what do you, what do you edit? Uh, 1080p 4K footage? Uh, 1080p at 60 FPS. I can say like one of the, I think one of the best features for me in Premiere, uh, or the reason why I would have anyone jump to it, is you know I shoot everything in 4K and I pull that into Premiere and you know I used to have a really crappy computer. This computer can handle 4K. I can I can edit 4K footage raw now. But before when I had a really crappy computer. Couldn't do it. Too choppy. Couldn't, you know, it took me forever. You click on the timeline and it's loading and loading. And it's like, yeah. how am I ever going to yeah. do it? Well, what you can do with, uh, and I don't know if you can do this with other software, but Premiere Pro has this concept of proxies. So you can pull in 4K footage and have it generate a 780p proxy that you use for editing. And then once you go to encode it, it'll encode the 4K footage. So that was like a huge quality of life uh, feature for me there. The, yeah. other, the other thing that I do is I use After Effects to do all my swipes and transitions and uh, post-processing and vignette and things like that. I just do a lot of stupid things with my videos to make them look like over-the-top produced. So having that integration with After Effects really helps. That's the thing. I also use that to sort of like, you know, I'm trying to work on so many things and I'm just trying to force myself. Like, don't go too crazy. Yeah. Chill out. Oh, I it's went just, too crazy. Tutorial. <laughs> but I do have those moments where... I do want to go a little bit crazy with things. Um, but yeah, I think the, this, the light version does do those sort of proxies as well. I don't know if it's as good, but it can do that sort of like, it has some color grading and vignettes and all that stuff. And it, it, it very much like gets the job done, you know? Yeah. But anytime you want to overlay any sort of text or maybe you want some sort of motion or just a little bit of that extra polish, it just, it, that's, it, that's not what it's for. Yeah, he, here's a really small thing that really ups the game of a video. Check this out. So let's say you're looking at code or you're looking at your Unity editor in your tutorial and you want to zoom in to one section. Like, let's say you're like, oh, now we're going to edit this thing in the edit in the um, what do you call it? The inspector Well, mm -hmm. depending on your your setup. It might be super tiny. So you got to zoom in on it. Right. Or you might do an overlay. Well, one thing I do is every time I zoom in. I do uh, I do an ease on the zoom, so it kind of yeah. like zooms in, and then I do a motion blur, and man, yeah. it looks so freaking good. Yeah. <laughs> it's like that yeah. one little thing, like a little motion blur and a, an ease into it is like wow. See, the thing is, it doesn't have those uh, those timelines or like those motion vector mm. type stuff, which is what I'm used to in Sony Vegas, where I could just be like, okay, I can go in here, I can adjust these keyframes, and I can yeah. make it do this like zoom in thing or this pan or whatever, but yeah, those when I want to do things like that, it makes me want to use Premiere. Yeah, yeah. But maybe 
you know, maybe I need to up my motion blur game. <laughs> I love motion blur. Oh, uh, it's funny. I, I guess just to bring it back to game development, um, I, I've learned a lot of things producing videos that I'm now applying to game development, like post, uh, post processing with color, um, you know, motion blur is a thing that I would, you know, you know, I mean, I guess maybe it's just my ex personal experience, but like I knew those things existed and, you know, before uh, HGRP came out, like you'd have to go through this whole process to get the post processing stack into your you know project and everything. But, you know, it really can take a very simple little demo that you've created in unity you slap on some post processing you get some color correction in there and man it can make something really simple and bland look really nice yeah i think like vignetting was is like usually the thing i feel maybe like a decade ago a lot of the racing games they all had the vignetting around it and oh it was yeah a very popular thing there was a a I don't know what the word is, but just a series of card games. There was like split second and there was another one that all had these, they were like arcade racers and they all had mm. this very like, uh, this, the, the vignetting around it. So if you want anything to look expensive. Vignette, yeah. yeah vignette. I do a vignette on my videos. At first I thought it would look too extreme, but I don't know, it makes it look <laughs> super produced. That. No, the thing is on thumbnails, like if you, yeah. it makes it look so much better. You just put like a little 25%, <laughs> even if it doesn't even register, it just, uh -huh. It's Makes subtle. Sense. It's yeah. it's like something the eye sees. There's a vignette on the uh, on this video's thumbnail. <laughs> there you go. Like yeah, and post processing on your picture. So there you go. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's that that like dives into a whole other topic. And we were talking about gifts and like really impressive Unity gifts. And like it's funny how a lot of the times, if you really consider what it you know what one of these gifts has, typically it's just it's not really it's really just like the composition's great and there's a vignette on it and there's post-processing and sometimes that's all you really need, you know? And, and you could take something that someone else might have posted just by like screen capping their editor and that's it. But if you put those little extra, little bit of love into it, I mean, it could look like a like hundred times better, you know? Yeah, and if you've, you know, factoring the direction of the action and things like that, if things are coming at the screen and things like that, it's like those little things that, you know, you yeah. get those likes. I think we just need to start making gifts. Gifts, right? <laughs> just, just do man, it. Man, I just, I just need. I don't know. This, I when I see people's gifts, I'm like, man, like, where did they get all of that incredible, like, art and just all this other stuff? You know, <laughs> I, I just see they just color correct it so well, or just the motion blur is there, and I'm just like, this looks magical to me. For a gift. <laughs> yeah. Uh, one, well, I got a question in here and, uh, from Stray. What are your thoughts on including VR view options in non-VR games like Breath of the Wild? <laughs> uh, I don't. I have thoughts. I, I mean, I have. A, I know. I know what my answer is. I don't know how to express that in a way that isn't mean sounding. Uh, not good. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's. It could be interesting, but. I think in some ways it sort of cheapens it cheapens both options it's just not both options but for vr i don't know it just i think another example outside of breath of the wild was just when they ported fallout 4 and skyrim to vr mm. and like when you go on to like the top sellers like those games are there and it's like would you say that those are a good like a communication Jeez. of what vr is and it's just like not not really you know it's there's a yeah. lot that goes into making something that's intuitive. Like even though the the world of Skyrim is so large and has all this stuff in it, we're not talking about Skyrim VR, right? We're like we don't really talk about it in a positive light. So it's mm. just sort of the and it it would be cool if more people did it, but it just it needs to have that level of, you know, they need to have someone who's really willing to understand it. And it's almost like making a whole new game. Mm -hmm. Because an example of that would be on Super Hot when they remade it for VR, it's practically an entirely new game. Mm. You know, it isn't just, oh, we made, we had super hot and we put a VR thing on it and we uploaded it to Quest and bing, bang, boom. It's mm. like, no, we just, it's like a whole new thing. And they just came out with, I forget the, it's like control alt something. It's, it's another, it's, it's, they say it's the sequel to um, super hot, but mm. people were asking, oh, where's the VR version? And they're just kind of like, well, we can't just port it, right? It's like, it's it requires 
a certain level of love and attention. You know, yeah. it's sort of like, I think there's a goat simulator joke where it's like, make it an MMO <laughs> and it goes into unity or something. And it says, goes up to the, some options. It goes, make MMO, you know, it's, it's, <laughs> that, that just that isn't a reality, you know? Right. Yeah. No, and it's, well, you make a good point because I feel like it could almost be like a slap in the face to other VR developers. If you were, if some big studio like just was a cash grab, hey, we're going to just drop a VR camera and into our game and just ship it and call it a day. Yeah. Like it's just not going to be a good experience. I think there was some level of, I don't know how to say this. Uh, there was a group of people on Twitter, I think when like cyberpunk or something like, oh yeah, we could put VR in in like 20 minutes. And there are people on Twitter who are always like, no, I don't think you could, you know, so. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I guess it's like the best I could say is like if you like just slamming a VR, uh, a VR view into a game is just not the way to go. You need to actually do what they did with uh, Superhot, which is actually think it through and put care into it. And even if that means rewriting a large chunk of how the, you know, interactions work and, and the game mechanics work. But, you know, maybe maybe building a VR experience in the same universe as your game, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. I think that's a fair trade off. I'm trying to think if there's anyone who's. Who's done that? Yeah, I, was, I don't know that to show it in like a different perspective or something like yeah. that. Like maybe with Breath of the Wild as an example, they if they release like, hey, we're going to give you a Breath of the Wild VR experience. You're going to play Link. You're locked into the specific area. You're not going to be doing, you know, a whole you're not going to be playing the game. But, hey, you, if you like Breath of the Wild so much and you want to be you want to interact with that world, we'll let you walk in this little area, you know, and that's. Yeah. yeah having something. Yeah. Having some sort of like. What's the word? Yeah, there's just companion, some sort of companion app to it. Ah, oh, yes, I like yeah, that. It's like yeah, a companion app. Yeah, that makes it like, oh, you know, this is this is going to be we're going to build like this one specific temple that you can only experience here. So you uh -huh. can, you know, and everything specifically built for this temple where we, you know, it's obviously not as big, but you're still going to get a high level of enjoyment out of it. You know, that's I think yeah. that's like a good sort of middle ground to hopefully people would take, I think. Yeah, and, and I I see that movies and TV shows do this. Uh, I think Stranger Things had like a VR experience where you could like walk through the house from the first season, and like little things would trigger as you walked through, like the light, like the Christmas lights on the wall. Yeah, and, I have not. I don't know if I've seen that. I I know there's they've released a few games, but I have not seen that before. Yeah, it's um yeah. I think I found it like in the Oculus browser, like the, you know they recommend some things to click on, and it's like oh you know. Stranger Things. Um, so, yeah, I think that's a good middle ground. But, yeah, if you do like a cat, if your studio does like a cash grab, just trying to like, like oh, Last of Us 2 in VR, they just slap it. Like, dude, there's just no way. Like, yeah, you, you had to rewrite the whole game. Yeah. I like <laughs> yeah. For like, oh, their new version of PSVR where we released, you know, basically what you said, just a, just, just a camera, you know, or <laughs> maybe even if it's just the sort of third third person character controller, but you could sort of look around or something like that. That's maybe something you could do. But again, like there are some games that do that on PSVR, but they do it like very well. Like Moss is one of them. Astrobot, which I haven't played that one, but people say people have good things to say about it. Mm. So Oh Moss? Yeah. Oh yeah. Moss is great. Yeah, yeah. I love that game. I I that was the first game I beat uh or got and beat. And um I, th I thought they were going to release new chapters, but yeah, really great game. Yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't know much about who made it or anything like that. But when it, when they were making it, it was kind of like, oh, okay, you know. I think it, the comes back to that idea of the world making sense, where you're, it's you're sort of, yes. it's a mouse. Obviously, it's very small. You're sort of this, you know, obviously, you're like you're, this little yeah. deity, deity kind of yeah. guy. Yeah exactly and that's sort of the character or the role you play and it, it makes sense right yeah um but i think there are other games that are may try to sort of mimic that same sort of format but don't have the same context so it doesn't really it doesn't really click as well which yeah. would kind of be if we had that 1950s game with the yeah. just random grabbing you know yo-yo grabbing yeah yo-yo yo -yo gloves yeah here we're gonna <laughs> here, here first. Uh, like a, a graphic of a yo-yo flies out of your hand um uh, yeah, so you know the interesting about Moss is when I first got my headset, I just got a whole bunch of games. You know, I got the Climb, I got 
you know, just every one of those games are like on the top of the of the Oculus store because I was like really like I want to I want to experience this like I was, I'm obsessed with VR. I want to be immersed. And I would say Moss was the first game that I got and played. And I was like, I just forgot that it was a VR game. Like I just enjoyed the experience so much that I played it because I was like, I want to know what's going to happen next in the story. I want to go in and and just experience more of it. And and th- and I was that's why I was super impressed with Moss. Like the climb, I I just I didn't like the climb because I got sick first of all. <laughs> but I just felt like okay, I'm climbing up. I'm climbing. You know, I don't. There just wasn't much else to it, and it just felt yeah. like well, this is a really cool demo of what VR can be and look like. But it just was like, what yeah. the heck am I doing? Just climbing I, this mountain. I don't gravitate towards any of those usually. It's if this is kind of a, I don't know if this is a mean thing to say, but if the generally if the title of your game has the word VR in it, I probably don't want to play. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. It's like, ten, it's like table tennis VR. I'm like, I don't want to play that. Basketball VR. I don't want to play that. <laughs> So it's just kind of it, it needs to have so much of an identity, except with maybe the exception is super hot, because I say super hot VR on it, I think. But uh, a lot yeah. of the times that's it needs a good, to, that's a good one, it though. It needs to have its own sort of established, you know, this is a core idea that we have. Yeah. Rather rather than this is something you're familiar with. We just made a VR equivalent of it. And it's just, you know, it's not the same. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, really quick, got a question, got a side question in the comments. Uh what kind of what kind of uh, headphones are we are we using? What kind of headphones you got on? I have these really old. I think they're Audio Technicas. They, I, I see the logo. Forty, I think they're like the mo. They're just like the one you're just like good headphones, and that's like the first thing that comes up. <laughs> I think before these, I had HyperXs, and those are great too. They're those are like sixty dollars, and they're really nice. 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 I'm using Sennheiser uh, HD six hundreds, which are way more than $60, but they're great. <laughs> yeah, I actually need a new pair, so. Those are I, great, I'll send you a link. Yeah, they're awesome. Sennheiser. I had a pair of Sennheisers. Um, I forget, they were like HD something, but I had those for, they they last like forever. So yeah. I think I had a pair for like 10 years, I think. I mean, I'm not an, I'm not an audiophile, so mm-hmm. like I look at the prices and I'm like, why did I spend so much on them? But they're really great, I like them. And they're, and they're back, uh, open back, so they're like, I can hear it when my wife comes in and says, hey, what are you doing? It's like, oh, I can hear you. So <laughs> that's that's a kind that's, of a nice feature. Yeah, I, I've seen those on those headsets where they're like, it has the, the sort of mesh or like speaker yeah. sort of like texture thingy. Yeah, <laughs> well, I'm gonna buy a pair of those then. Another we'll question. Yeah, heck yeah, dude. I, I've, yeah. I've seen these. I mean, one of the reasons I got these is because, well, Jason, well, he's an audiophile and he really like hyped them up. So I was like, all right. But I've seen a bunch of YouTubers ha- use them too. So I was like, well, not that I don't believe Jason, but now I can look like all the other YouTubers. So that's great. I'm, I'm going for it. All right, now, you know, it was the headset. It, was, it wasn't the fact that you like work and make contests. Like once I had the headset, oh, it yeah. made it real. Exactly. That's what made it real. That and all my RGB lighting and my, yeah. uh, my two key lights. I <laughs> see you're, that's another level. I wish I, I need, I just have my windows. There you go. Natural light. You know, there's nothing wrong with that. Yeah. <laughs> Unless it rains or gets cloudy. <laughs> it, is, it, it is right now, but it still looks all right. <laughs> nice. Uh, another question. Um, how did, how long, how long did it take you to earn your VR legs? Interpret that as you will. Um, that's, I don't that's think a, I've gotten mine. Uh, yeah, it, it, that's an interesting, there's a, there's an article that's written by a guy. He is the like lead tech guy for absurd joy. It's like this other company that was started by the people who made job simulator or alchemy labs, I think. But that concept that is like VR legs, it, he's, he says that it is particular to a pair, to a game that you're playing. There are some games that I can use like, mm locomotion in and that's fine mm. but you know some some i just can't play for whatever reason for a long period of time when it comes to like teleporting or just more one-to-one sort of stuff i'm fine despite what it is but there are some things that just may not agree with people mm. um i have do have some sensitivity to like motion sickness so i think even uh charles was like you know when i was playing the climb i wasn't yeah. feeling particularly well <laughs> you know it, it sometimes it's it may be the type of motion, but other times it's just, um, you know, we as people. Yeah. <laughs> I guess that's the. Uh, but I guess I'm trying to say if you're 
it, more interested in that topic, there is a guy who's much smarter than I am who's written an article about it <laughs> that I agree with. <laughs> I find that to be the case for almost every topic that anyone ever brings up for me. It's like someone else smarter than me has already talked about this. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I would do my best. <laughs> yeah, before I did this, it was when I was working a you know, my, my other like retail type jobs, it's like, we'll find someone who gets paid more than me to deal with your problem. <laughs> That's funny. Yeah. I, I mean, honestly, I cannot do locomotion. I get sick every time I tried it with half-life Alex. Cause I was like, well, let me, let me see. Maybe I can do it on this one. Can't do it. Can't do climbing. Yeah. I, I played I Vader. Do- I played Vader immortal. And like, it was great. Never got sick. Then I had to climb things and I was like, Oh gosh. Yeah. <laughs> it, it, it's, it's sometimes I don't, Sometimes it's the speed, sometimes the acceleration. Like I've made some locomotion things and I can test those and play play with them and I'm fine. But there's other times where I can get on Sun Games and it's just like almost, not immediately, but I remember when I first got, I didn't get really sick, but I didn't, I got really weird. Mm. A really weird feeling is when I was on, it was like an RPG type of thing and I was on a horse and you would be fine when you're looking forward, but the, if, it was kind of like having blinders on, but the oh, right. as soon as you turn to the right and your peripheral vision sort of catches something that's moving, it like throws off like Oof. everything. And that's, that's where it gives you that weird feeling. Well, I'm getting sick just hearing about it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah I, I was super excited to get Minecraft. Cause I, I mean, I, I've, I've been playing Minecraft for years. Just, I love that game. And I was like, yes, VR, let's go. And uh, yeah, no, can't do it. Can't play it. I, I just can't do the locomotion. I've, I've never tried Minecraft in VR. What's funny about Minecraft and VR is when you first get it and, and start playing it, you're with well, the VR experience is you're sitting on a couch, like a Minecraft built couch playing on a screen. That's how you're playing. Like that's the VR experience, but then you can hit Y on your controller and then you f- go into the world and then you control the character. And that's where I just, I get sick. But uh, otherwise I can sit on a VR block couch and play Minecraft VR. <laughs> that's Isn't that wild. Yeah. That's I'm kind of speechless. See, that's, that's what weird. every game should do. It's like Skyrim VR, last of us VR. We got you. We're going to sit you on a couch in the environment of our game and put a TV in front of you, and you're going to play the same game just in VR space. That kind of makes me think <laughs> that more like VR dashboards should do it like that. Right, yeah. <laughs> Where they do sort of make you have your own sort of like customizable room that you do have, but having it more sort of, it's there's always kind of something running in the background that you can easily kind of click on, and it'll just take you in there without having to wait the two minutes for or whatever for it to load. Yeah, that's not, yeah, it's, that's it's something. Smart. It's an interesting. Con- yeah, it's super. Well, it's I don't know how I feel about it. like, super bizarre. When I first got it, I was like, "Bro, I, I thought I was gypped." I was like, "I just paid." You know, I had the regular Minecraft. Well, I had the Java Minecraft. I don't know what they call it anymore. But like, I I remember I the first Minecraft uh, executable I ever got was off of. It wasn't 4chan, but it was like a forum, and it was like back in the day before. Um, you know, Microsoft had bought it up. It was like a long time ago when, when when Mojang was just getting started up and I don't even think Jeb was there or maybe he had just started. So like, uh, I don't know why I'm being a hipster about Minecraft, but I, I, ha- I didn't realize when I tried to get back into it that, oh no, and there's two versions now. There's like the legacy Java version and then there's the, you know, the Microsoft version that you'd get off the Windows store. Yeah, I, uh, I believe I actually have the windows version because the java version i had was before they had i didn't play it a whole lot but i was sort of the same way it was just some random executable my friend like sent me <laughs> in a zip file you're like what is this shit server that we have come play and like that was it but then nowadays you have to go to like the official website and that's you know 25 dollars or whatever it is now <laughs> Yeah. Well, uh, anyway, I paid way too much to get the VR version. And when I first booted it up, it was me sitting on a couch and I was like, what the heck? And then I realized I can click Y and go in the world. And I was like, oh, sweet. I didn't waste my money. And then I moved forward and I was like, oh, wait, I did. I did waste my money. <laughs> how, like, how you mine blocks in it. This is a strange conversation to have about yeah. Minecraft. But does it does I don't it think you I don't think yeah. you actually have to hit. I think you hold the button and, and your little arm. Yeah. That'd be kind of cool though, actually. Well, no, that'd be kind of, that'd be kind of awful. Very, that's, and that's why I was asking. Cause yeah. it's like, it, I think there may be, how would you make that not exhausting? 
but still like interactive. It'd be an interesting mode to enable. So like that could be your workout for the day. You're just like, oh, that's a good, that's a good idea. yeah, but it's huh. like, what are you working out? You're just like working your yeah. arms out all day. Yeah. Yeah, people, <laughs> instead of steps, we have blocks. So you can, <laughs> you moved your arms today. Uh, that's awesome. Well, thank you. Thank you, Andrew, for being on the stream. I think we talked about a lot of really interesting topics that we, yeah. I don't normally get to dive into, like yo-yos yeah. and juggling. Yeah. I'm glad <laughs> you could show off your juggling. <laughs> yes, that's thank why, you. Why you do this. Like up until this point, you're like, I can't wait to like show people that I can juggle. I knew, I knew if I had Andrew on, yeah. he'd be the guy I, I could show it off to. We could get into a conversation about <laughs> No, but this was good. I mean, you... I'm still really excited about VR development. I'm really excited to see, you know, Unity's, uh, uh, what is it, A XRTK? Yeah, that's right, I'm Got one of the cool kids. XRTK, yeah, I'm excited for that. Um, and it's interesting, you know, to learn more about, like getting, so getting into VR development isn't difficult per se. The hard part is just figuring out which one of these development kits you wanna use and, you know, What's the purpose? What are you trying to make? Um, and then making the right decision on what development kit to fit you know, your needs. So I'm excited to see your series that you're going to be working on um, because I really want to follow it through and, and explore each of these these kits to see how they work. Because I started doing it and I pretty much just gave up because I was like, I really have no true use case, you know, so I, I really have no reason to like, you know, but but I'm excited to follow your your tutorial. So. Thank you. And also thanks for having me. It's been a, it's been a good time. Yeah, man. It's been great. Want to have you on again, definitely soon. Uh, maybe when you're done with the series, we can have you back on. I want to follow through it and I want to see, I, oh, I have, sure. I'm, I'm going to have a hundred oh, questions. I'll wait to, you know, we don't know where the end is. So like maybe, what? maybe we'll uh, do like a month, you know, we'll see. Well, we'll so see you're going to, you're going to have a gun shooting at a target. How about yeah. when you, when you get to the gun part, I'll follow along and then we'll have a, we'll have a follow up. Okay. Yeah, we could do that. All right. That cool. sounds like a good one. And then if we, and then at that point we'll check in and we'll say like, well, what, 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 what else may people want? And then we can, I like it and then see what we can do. I like it. I like it. Well, thanks again for, for, for being on. And, um, if you guys want to follow, uh, Andrew, I put some links in the description, um, to his YouTube channel, which is VR with Andrew, as well as his Twitter. So go and follow him. Subscribe to him, like all his videos, and if you haven't done it already, please, please like this video. Um, Sunday, this Sunday, we will be streaming, me and Jason, we're gonna be doing another live tutorial, just like we did two weeks ago. Um, a topic to be determined, so uh, keep an eye out for that. And other than that, everyone, have a great day. Andrew, have a great day. Thank you. Thanks again, man. Thank you. Bye, guys. Bye.